I forgot to wait for my music. I'm sorry. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Everybody's doing well today, I hope. We are going to continue. Uh, Pastor Doug's been talking about this book, Half Truths. We are going to continue that today. But I'm going to confess to you something uh, before we get into this too deeply, and that is this. The saying today that we are going to use, I will confess to you that until I actually picked up this book and read it, uh, read this chapter, I had never heard this saying before. The saying is this, God said it, I believe it, it's settled. Have any of you ever heard that before? Have any of you ever heard that? A couple. I have a couple. That, that seems to be about what it's running. Every service I seem to have about, you know, four, five, six people that have heard that saying before. <coughs> I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't. Uh, that doesn't mean I don't understand what it means. We're talking about Scripture here, and we're talking about interpreting Scripture here, that our view of Scripture is God said it, I believe it, it's settled. No argument, no question. There's nothing to talk about any further than that. But my question for you today is, do you really think that way? Do you really, really think that way, that God settled it, uh, that God said it, I believe it, that settles it? And I'm really sticking to that last part, that part that says that settles it. No further discussion, nothing else. I'm not going to hear anything else about it. Do you really believe that? Because if you really believe that, my guess is you live your life according to that scripture, right? Right? I'm assuming you would. I get it. And if that's the case, then you're going to have to explain some things to me because let's look at this scripture from the Old Testament, okay? Let's look at some of these. Exodus 21, verses 20 <coughs> and 21, excuse me. Look it up if you don't believe me. But I'm going to paraphrase right now, but this is what it says. Essentially, what it says in, that, in Exodus is, if a person beats his slave to death with a rod, they will be punished. If, however, and it says it this way, if, however, after a day or two, the slave gets up again, then it's okay because that's your property. Do we really believe that God is in favor of slavery? That, that verse was used in this country in the 1800s and 19th century to say God is on the side of slavery. Just letting you know. Some other ones a little less serious. Leviticus 11.7 says you're not allowed to eat anything from a pig. Okay? I don't know about you. This is horrible news in my life. No ham. <laughs> No bacon? Come on. I don't, I, I don't know how I can live that way. Uh, Leviticus 11.9. Uh, this is a little lesser known, but same thing. Shrimp. You're not allowed to eat shrimp. You know that? I've been, I, I said this the last service, and I'm going to stick with it. I've been with some of you, not to mention any names or anything, at a buffet. I've seen what happens to the shrimp. I've seen what happens. I don't think a whole lot of people are following through on Leviticus 11.9. Uh, Leviticus 19.19, 19. I hope you're wearing nothing but pure cotton or pure wool today because that says we're not allowed to have blends in our clothes. We can't have two fabrics or more together in our clothes. And then here's Leviticus 19.28. Should I just skip this one? I should, probably should just skip this one. No, I'm going to say it anyway. Okay, that says that you're not allowed to have, does anybody know what it is? No? No, it's not alcohol. Anybody, you're not allowed to have a tattoo, okay? Now, I am not, in interest of good taste, going to show you my tattoo. <laughs> you don't really believe I have a tattoo, do you? <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a tattoo. There is no way. I would be way too scared. There's no way. <laughs> And I'm going to be honest with you, I don't care if you have a tattoo. I don't really care. Now, I, you know, 
that might come back to haunt me here in a second because that could be an issue with me saying that I don't care if you have a tattoo, all right? Keep that in your mind, but let's come back to that. Because my guess is some of you are saying, okay, this is great. Yeah, this is, you know, some, some levity perhaps, but this is the Old Testament we're talking about. Of course, I'm not going to pay attention to that. It's the Old Testament. Why should we worry about that? Why does that mean anything to us? But before we go too far, here's where this kind of half-truth, this idea God said it, uh, I believe it, that settles it. Here's where it really comes from. It comes from Scripture. Jesus himself, these are the words of Jesus in the book of Matthew. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. And that was Jesus referring to the Old Testament. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now here's where I get in trouble for saying I don't care if you have a tattoo. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Uh-oh. <laughs> but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So tell me, how much trouble am I in for saying I don't care if you have a tattoo or not. Because am I not teaching you against what that law in Leviticus says? Is Jesus saying, I'm in probably bigger trouble than you? You may have, you know, those of you who have a tattoo, you may have broken that rule, but I'm probably worse because I'm teaching you I don't care. So, that was the background. Let's look now first at the Old Testament, then we're going to look at all of Scripture because I want to get to the heart of this idea about interpreting Scripture, about what Scripture really means, about how settled it really is. And so let me use the Old Testament. Let me use something that my professor, uh, uh, who taught me a class that was literally called Old Testament. It was like the base class, the first class you had to take in the Old Testament. It was kind of a survey of the Old Testament. And he taught us something on the first day of class that made me go, wait a minute, are you sure about this? But he kept pounding it into our heads. And what he taught us on that first day, in the first hour, he says, guess what? The Old Testament, it doesn't apply to you as a Christian. It doesn't apply to you. And I said, what? And of course, there's always that smart aleck in class, isn't there, who said, okay, professor, if it doesn't apply to me as a Christian, then on the final, can I just write any question? Can I just say, it doesn't apply to me? And I get an A, right? That work? And he said, not quite. There's more to this than that. First he explained, why does it not apply to you as a Christian? Because the Old Testament is God's covenant with his chosen people, with the people of Israel. God has a covenant with them. God has an agreement with them. I will be your God, you will be my people. And it's more complex than that, but essentially, in its essence, that's what it is. He has a covenant with them. There's rules, there's regulations, there's all kinds of things that he sets up for them, but it doesn't apply to us because we have a new covenant with God. We have Jesus Christ. Our covenant with God is at its essence, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Believe that He is our Lord, our Messiah, our Savior. Believe that, and God says, and in return, I will give you eternal life. And so we have a new covenant with God. And that's what Jesus was talking about in that scripture. I have come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He is the fulfillment of scripture. But for this sake, he's saying, our professor was saying to us, it doesn't apply to you for that reason, but to answer all the smart Alex in the class, <coughs> it still is important. We can't just throw out the Old Testament. There's a couple reasons for that. Number one, there's the obvious, it's a historical import and it shows us how God's plan has unfolded through the years, how we got to the point where Jesus was a necessity. But more importantly, it teaches us who God is. 
It teaches us the attributes of God. Because we can agree, can't we, that God always was, is, and will be the same. And if we can agree on that, then the way God acted, whether it be the Old Testament, the New Testament, yesterday, tomorrow, a hundred years from now, that God is the same. He has the same attributes. He is timeless in that regard. But what we're saying is, okay, if we can agree that God was the same, then we can go back and look at the Old Testament and say, what does that show us about God? Because God is unknowable to us as humans. We can't get our heads around God in any real sense. But we understand God and we learn about God by what He reveals to us, by what He shows of Himself to us. And here, God is showing His attributes to us. So let's do an example, because I think that's the easiest way to understand it. Let's look at Sabbath rules. We know, <coughs> excuse me, we know, don't we, that there were Sabbath rules that essentially said you cannot work on the Sabbath. You cannot do work. And if you do work, there is going to be some pretty strong punishment up to and including death in certain situations. If you do certain things on the Sabbath, you could literally be put to death. And so you stand back and you say, so what does that mean? teach me about God. It makes it sound like God is really harsh, but let's not look at it that way. Let's look at it this way. Here's what it teaches us about God. It says, number one, God knows us. He created us. He made us. And He knows that we need to step back once in a while. We need rest and relaxation. We need to refresh our mind, our body, our soul. And so God said, I know, I know you guys. I know you way too well. And if I say, just chill out one day of the week, you're not going to listen to me. So I'm going to put some rules in place that say you have to do it because you need it. It's good for you. And so therefore, what we really learn about God himself is that he's caring. He's compassionate. He's loving. He cares so much about you that he's telling you, you have to relax. Calm, be calm. Let, let your mind and your body recuperate. Refresh your spirit. We learn how much God loves us through this. And so it's of very great importance that we learn these rules so that we know that. And, and let's wrap it into Jesus, what he said about not coming to do away with the law. He's not coming to do away with the Sabbath. But what is he saying? What is Jesus saying? It's about us. Because what does Jesus say? He says, uh, the Sabbath, man is not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is made for man. <laughs> So Jesus says, you're not made so that you have to follow these bunch of rules about the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made so that you can rest and relax and that you can refresh your soul again. So Jesus is saying, you guys see it all along. The rule is there. You're just misinterpreting it. You're just looking at it the wrong way. You're not seeing it through God's eyes, through the eyes of Jesus. How about sacrifices? Same thing, right? We're not saying that sacrifice isn't necessary. We used to sacrifice, uh, you know, animals to God. God isn't saying sacrifices. Jesus doesn't come and say sacrifices are no longer necessary. Instead, he says, oh no, there's a big sacrifice that's still necessary, and it's me. It's Jesus. And that he takes care of that for us once and for all. Again, not getting rid of the rules. They don't apply to us, but we learn about God through them. And Jesus says, I am fulfilling all of those rules. So, that's the Old Testament. But some of you would now say, so what about the New Testament? The New Testament's a whole different thing. This is our covenant with God, isn't it? This is about us. So we have to pay attention to this. But there are things in the New Testament too. Let's be honest. There are things that we don't like to talk about just like we went through in the Old Testament. For example... You're not supposed to be wearing jewelry. As I cover up my wedding ring, you can't. You're not supposed to be doing that. 
Joyce, I said that the last service, and she said, go ahead, take it off. I'm not, you know, whatever. <laughs> she put me into play. And it, you know. <laughs> oh, she's still laughing at that. <laughs> You're not allowed, but one more important thing. <laughs> Women are not allowed to speak in church. Mm -hmm. And I got her back with that. I got her back. So how do we reconcile that? I use that as a joke, but it's, in, it's there. It's in Scripture. Go look in Timothy. Paul talks about those things. It is in our New Testament Scripture. How do we reconcile that? And here's what I would say to you. Scripture, and I think this is the lesson we're supposed to learn from all this, Scripture is not so simple that we can just say, God said it, I believe it, it's settled. I think Scripture is extremely complicated. It's complex is a better word. Scripture is complex. And you know why? Because I don't believe for one second that Scripture is just dead words on a page. I don't believe that at all. I believe in, with all of my heart that Scripture is inspired by God. It is given to us by God. And maybe just as importantly, it is read through the lens of Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit within us, helping to understand what it says, what it means, how it speaks to us. And so I don't believe for a minute that I can sit here and say, God said it, I believe it, so it's settled. Yeah, God said it, I believe it, but is it really settled? Because I believe Scripture's too complex to say that. Let me give you an example as to the reason why I believe that and why I think all of you at the end of the day actually agree with me. You might not think it now, but I'm telling you, I know you and you agree with me. And you know how I know that? Because I would almost guarantee that anybody here who has read Scripture on a fairly regular basis has had this happen to them. Have you ever had it happen where you read a Scripture and it really speaks to you? It really means something to you, like, wow, this is important in my life right now. This must have been written just for me because this really talks to me right now and it makes a difference in my life. And then a year later, you read the exact same Scripture. You're at a totally different place in your life. It means something totally different to you. And I don't mean that it's in conflict with what you read before. I mean it has a deeper or a different meaning or something from a slightly different angle. It speaks to you where you are at that moment. <coughs> Haven't you had that happen? And then another, maybe three, four years later, you're in a Bible study and somebody says, well, here's what that scripture meant to me. And it's a third thing. And it's the same scripture, the same words, the same few sentences. And I believe with all my heart that's because the Holy Spirit is working through those words. And it may mean something different to every one of us at that particular time. It may speak to us in a totally different way than it did just a week ago or a month ago or a year ago. That doesn't mean either of them are wrong. It's why you can give three people the exact same scripture and then you end up hearing three different sermons about it that are totally all right and all on point but coming from different angles. Why? Because Scripture is that complex. I have, theologically speaking, what they call a high view of Scripture. That means I, I truly believe that Scripture is inspired from God. It is from God. And here's my proof. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is God breathed. I believe that with all my heart. I believe it's from God. I believe it's in our Bible because God wanted it in our Bible. So I have no problem at all with saying God said it. I believe it. I do with all my heart. But is it settled? No, because guess what? I have read scripture where a week later it means something else to me where it means more. I have talked about Scripture, and I have said specific things up here. This is what I believe it means, and I have three people come up to me afterwards and say, I think it means this to me, so I'm glad you said that. It's like, I didn't even say it. <laughs> but they, but people hear it the way it means something to them, and I don't believe that's a mistake. I don't believe that's just coincidence. I believe that's the Holy Spirit. I really do. 
And so at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I would say this to you. I believe the important thing about this is <coughs> that we need to read Scripture with Jesus as our focus. That if we read Scripture with Jesus at the heart of it, then it makes sense. Then those different interpretations make sense because Jesus is saying, you need to look at it. It needs to be personal to you in that regard. Now, I want to throw one warning out, and I think this is very important. We have to be careful. Not, that doesn't, I'm not trying to stand here and say, every interpretation of Scripture is just as valid as the next. Okay? I'm not trying to say that. I'm not trying to say that you can look at the words in Scripture and just come up with whatever you think it means today, and that's it. It has to still be in context of what it says it, uh, with the words around it. It has to be in context of the rest of Scripture as well. This is what I'm saying. Jesus needs to be the focus when we read Scripture. He is at the center of it all. We can change that saying, I believe, and make it make a lot more sense if we say, God said it, I believe it, Jesus settles it. And speaking of Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, do you know this? This is a fact for you. Do you know that Jesus gave us two specific commands that we have now made uh, into rituals, uh, into, uh, oh, wow, what are the words? Sacraments. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> uh, sacraments in the church. One of them is for communion. Jesus commanded us to do that. And the other is baptism. And so I am really lucky. I get to do a baptism today.